One of the most controversial, or we might say in a certain sense dangerous, at least to white audiences, elements of rhythm and blues music has to do with the hokum blues and the perception that these lyrics were sexual uh, in maybe a kind of a shocking kind of way in rhythm and blues music. Now, there, the hokum blues tradition is not limited to black styles. There's this big misconception out there that hokum blues is the property of, of the black community and, and, and for people who have hold racist views that it somehow indicates the sort of lack of sophistication uh, of the black community. But it's, it's not act, actually true. You can find hokum blues uh, in, in white music um, and Jimmy Rogers, who we spoke of uh, several videos ago, uh, has got a great uh, hokum blues called Pistol Pack and Papa from 1930, which really sort of proves that um, this is not the exclusive province of, of uh, the black tradition. I don't say this in any way to disparage the black tradition at all, but just to sort of guard it from uh, overgeneralizations or perhaps racist generalizations that it really comes out of some kind of racial thing there. Um, the Hokum Blues, in fact, is a playful type of song, a humorous kind of song, meant for adult audiences, not for teenagers. And so in an adult audience, to playfully, through the use of double entendres and metaphors, talk about sexuality, sexual relationships and activities between a man and a woman in a way that plays with the idea of the thing without ever actually saying it in a raw or vulgar way. Continuing to work with metaphors and double entendres in ways that are clever. Everybody knows what you're getting at and you're, you're taking joy in how it is the singer can say it in a way that doesn't actually say the thing but says it in a colorful way that makes it fun. And that's what the hokum blues is about. Most white uh, parents who heard their <laughs> heard the songs their kids were listening to sometimes didn't really understand that those songs were never intended for kids. This was not the stuff that they, nobody really sort of thought about this for teenagers. So there was a, a real reaction against um, some of the sexual lyrics in R&B and in Hulk and Blues uh, and that's a big part of the changeover from, rock and, from rhythm and blues to rock and roll that we'll talk about uh, next week. So one of the reasons why whites tended to under, misunderstand this practice is, first of all, they didn't know very much about the black community at all. And secondly, one of the myths that existed in culture was this staggerly myth and the idea that black men are really only ever concerned with deflowering virginal white women. Um, and so when you hear a black man singing a song about sexuality and you're a white person who doesn't really understand very much about black culture hearing this, it may reinforce all of these negative stereotypes and you may say, I don't want my daughter listening to that, it's a hell and perdition, you know. Um, and so there was a real reaction against these kinds of tunes. Now, to be fair, some of the titles were Pretty ob it was pretty obvious what some of the songs were about. Here are some of the titles for you. Let Me Play With Your Poodle, 60 Minute Man, Work With Me Annie, Annie Had a Baby, right? So it's not real hard to figure out what these tunes are going to be about. Um, what white artists did when a hokum blues would get uh, big on the charts, on the R&B charts, and they wanted to uh, cover that song for the mainstream pop art, uh, charts is they would do the song but they would change the lyrics and they would take or obscure the sexual parts of it uh, such that in many cases Freud would love it um, the sexual references are replaced with references to dancing and so in many ways sex is sublimated into dancing and so the songs become squeaky clean inoffensive and acceptable to everybody and just about good clean teenage white middle class uh, fun so even a song uh, like shake rattle and roll originally done by big joe turner when it's covered by bill haley and the comets becomes a hit for him and nobody has any idea what a one-eyed cat could possibly be peeping at a seafood store. It's almost like we're talking about one of the characters from Disney's Aristocats or something. But of course, in the original Big Joe Turner, that is a very colorful metaphor for the male and female genitalia. In a group of adults hearing this, it's fun. When your kids are in the room, 
it's maybe a little bit embarrassing. And so one of the things that starts to happen in next, next week, we'll talk about cover versions and crossover and this kind of thing, is that a lot of these songs that were originally hits on the R&B charts had to have the lyrics changed significantly before they had any chance of landing on the mainstream pop charts. The black artists that were involved in this didn't like this idea at all and saw it as just another way in which black people were being discriminated against and not having the same opportunity as white people. So this kind of racial element that's already a part of the community is very much a part of those first days of rock and roll. But this anticipates our story. Let's think about all that next week when we think about the first days of rock and roll, 1955 through 1959.